I'm Dave Palumbo, founder of Species Nutrition. I created Species Nutrition with one mission in mind, to provide bodybuilders and serious athletes with no-nonsense supplements that work and are backed by science. From my earliest bodybuilding days, I believed in only putting the best in my body. And that lives on in the Species Nutrition line of products. We use only top-of-the-line formulations dosed for maximum results and the best flavoring systems available. I put my name and reputation on every bottle of Species Nutrition products. If you want to be your absolute best, join the evolution. Dave Palumbo here with a supplement and science update. Guys, today we're going to talk about insulin. I know you guys love insulin, so I figured let's talk more insulin. You know, we don't have Milos here today, but we're going to be talking about the science of insulin and how insulin works in your body and what goes on when it doesn't work well and what you have to do to supplement it. You know, because as bodybuilders, we, we live a lifestyle that, that's pretty interesting in the sense that we eat enormous amounts of food. Even though we eat very healthy, we put an enormous demand on our pancreas, specifically the beta cells of the pancreas, which are the cells that produce insulin, to have to crank out a lot of insulin. So we, don't, we might not eat tons of sugar in our diet, but we're eating large amounts of carbohydrates, which require that we absorb those carbohydrates, which require that our bodies release a lot of insulin. And putting that huge demand on the body on a regular basis for long periods of time 10, 20, 30 years can actually lead to pancreatic burnout, beta cell burnout, meaning that the cells stop working and stop producing as much insulin as efficiently. Now, if you add drugs like growth hormone onto the equation, growth hormone acts almost like the opposite of insulin and it prevents insulin from doing its job. And because insulin can't get to the receptor because there's so much GH around, the body has to produce extra insulin to do the same job it would do prior to that, which makes, which is basically another way of saying your body becomes a little insulin resistant when you're on GH. Because of that, and the uh, addition of all that food we're eating, we're putting an even greater strain on the pancreas, and eventually the pancreas can start to fail. And we see that in a lot of guys that are passing 30, 35, into their 40s, we're seeing people are running elevated blood sugars. Now, the great thing about you know blood sugar monitoring nowadays is you don't have to go to the doctor to do it. You can go to your local Walmart or drugstore and you can buy a glucose monitor. You can even go on Amazon.com and buy one. They're relatively cheap. I know Walmart sells them for actually $9. I mean, how could you go wrong with that? A rely on you know, blood glucose meter or glucometer as it's called. You can test your blood sugar. Usually the best times to test blood sugar are first thing in the morning, which is known as your fasting blood sugars, or you know, usually about two hours post meal. And usually I tell people to test your two hour post meals after your biggest meals of the day. Now, the morning fasting blood sugar should be under 90, and the two hour post meal should be under 130. That's the, that's the dogma now, that's the, 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 the standards. If you're running over that, it means you don't have good glucose, glucose control, and it means you probably have a problem either with glucose sensitivity, insulin sensitivity, or you're just not producing enough insulin or a combination of the two. Usually, like I said, in bodybuilding situations, it's usually that the pancreas is, is, is straining to try to keep up with the demand, and it can't. Uh, the first, what, you know, what a lot of people don't realize is that they have this, what we break down insulin release into phase one and phase two insulin release. Phase one is usually the immediate release. In other words, huge surge of sugar in the blood, usually because you ate a meal, um, or you're in the middle of the night before you wake up, your pancreas, excuse me, your liver will release a huge amount of glucose from the stored glycogen stores in the liver, and your pancreas must respond by releasing a huge amount of insulin to absorb this rise in blood sugar. Um, when your pancreas is not able to produce enough insulin, that's usually the first uh, notice that we, we take is that that first phase insulin starts to fail, meaning that you eat a big glucose meal uh, or a good, big carbohydrate-laden meal, I should say, um, or you wake up in the morning and your blood sugars are running higher than they should. Okay, why is that? Well, because the pancreas just can't keep up, it can't produce enough insulin. So what's the first thing we do? The doctor puts you on glucophage, which helps you know, suppress your liver from producing glucose. Uh, supposedly it, it helps with some insulin sensitivity. But what you're really basically doing is you're not removing the demand from the pancreas, it's still 
being required to produce a large amount of insulin that it can't handle. So it's not really solving the problem. It's like a placebo. Some people will go out and take all these herbal insulin sensitizers or insulin mimickers to help the pancreas. And unfortunately, most of them are just not that strong and not that quantifiable, meaning that you don't know how much to take to get the necessary drop in blood sugar to kind of help your body or aid it in controlling blood sugar properly. Phase two is what happens like all the time. So you always have a constant influx of sugar into the blood, whether you're eating or not, and that's because the liver is constantly producing um, glucose from amino acids, a process known as gluconeogenesis. It's also constantly releasing glucose into the bloodstream via the glycogen stores in the muscles in the liver. So what happens is a hormone also produced in the pancreas known as glucagon, it's produced by the alpha cells of the pancreas, is released and glucagon tells the stored glycogen break up, release the glucose in the bloodstream so that we can keep steady state glucose to provide the brain with energy, the working muscles with energy, and, and the body with energy. The problem is every time we have a release of, of small amounts of glucose in the bloodstream, the pancreas has to respond and release insulin. Usually phase two is not affected immediately, right away. So you don't really notice the phase two. When you're not eating, you know, usually during the day, your blood sugars will be normal. It's only when you have, need a big surge of insulin, phase one release, that you notice that, that there's a problem. Um, and when you do notice there's a problem, there's different ways of addressing it, like I said. The best way, however, is to take the burden off the pancreas. In other words, take the workload off the pancreas. Let the pancreas rest, okay? If you're going to continue to eat a lot of food, okay, and take GH, or not even take GH, but just eat an enormous quantity of, of, of nutrition, you got to help the pancreas do its job, or what's going to happen is all the cells in the beta, all those beta cells in the pancreas are going to die off. And if they die off, you're going to become a, a, an insulin-dependent diabetic for the rest of your life. And we don't want that, okay? So what we do is we take a, uh, initially what I usually recommend that people do is, is get on a longer acting insulin, um, like a, what we call a basal insulin. Atlantis seems to be this, the, the, the gold standard right now. It's reasonably priced, okay, and it's um, pretty easy to use. They say it, it's a 24 hour insulin, but it's really not, it only lasts about 18 hours. So usually what we have people do is take two shots of it. Usually at night is the bigger shot usually around t anywhere from 10 to 15 units, and then before bed, and then in the morning you take another five to 10 units. Usually that's where you start off with, and then you keep increasing it until you get your blood sugar, once again, those fasting sugars in the morning under 90. If you can get them under 90, you're in good shape. That's what we're looking for. Um, it's a pretty easy insulin to measure. Once again, an insulin syringe measures in insulin units. is really easy, you draw it up, you, you lift the skin, you put it under the skin subcutaneously, and you don't worry about it. The good thing about long-acting insulin is that it doesn't drop your blood sugar right away. It's a very long, sustained type of action it has. So you don't, you could literally take it and go to sleep and you're not gonna get lows with it. And that, that's, that, there's, a, there's a much greater safety net with a long-acting insulin. They have a newer insulin out now that's called Trishiba, um, but it's a little more expensive, okay? It is a true 24-hour insulin. You only have to take it once a day. Um, but the problem with Trisiba is that it is really expensive, and so most people will opt for the Lantus. Um. Now, the, also another problem is getting doctors to understand the science of this and, and, and to actually prescribe the stuff, because most doctors don't know how this stuff works. They don't want to prescribe it. They're scared. They think people are going to screw up. They're going to you know, hurt themselves. And they, they, quite frankly, most of these doctors don't know much about it. So they won't prescribe it to a person who's not an insulin-dependent type 1 diabetic. And that's unfortunate. But hopefully, as we're, the education you know, start, keeps coming out, more doctors will understand that this is a better way to preserve beta cell function long term, and it's actually going to be healthier for the, for the person to take it. Now, if you're taking a long-acting insulin and your blood sugars are still rising too high two hours after your big meals, meaning that you're, you're measuring your blood sugars and they're in the 130 still two hours after a, a huge meal, no matter how big it is, no matter how much junk, your blood sugar should be under 130 after two hours. That means that the, the long-acting insulin still is not good enough. It's not solving the problem, even though we might have got those fasting blood sugars under control. What that means is that you need to take a short-acting insulin that's going to help bring down the blood sugar from these bigger meals that you're eating. So maybe you're eating two or three bigger meals during the day that your body just can't handle. You might need to use a, a fast-acting insulin like Humalog. Now, Humalog hits you very quickly, within minutes, you know, within 15 minutes. So you don't want to take that and go to sleep, okay? That would be a big mistake. 
And you know, usually the way we figure out you know, how, many, how much uh, Humalog to use is it's 10 grams of carbohydrates okay, per one insulin unit of Humalog. So if you take five units of Humalog, that's enough to cover 50 grams of carbs. Now protein also does raise blood sugar a little bit. So usually you know, if you were a true type one diabetic, you would have to calculate protein into the equation. But since you still do produce your own insulin, you really don't need to do that. Um, so usually just count carbs. If you, like I said, a lot of people are not going to need to do this, but if you do have, like I said, blood sugar control issues and you're eating an enormous amount of food, if you're eating 80 grams of carbs at a meal, you, you probably should take eight units of insulin. And I'm assuming you're eating protein and fats probably with the meal as well, but you want to cover the carbs. That takes the burden off the pancreas of doing that. The pancreas can just worry about whatever might convert in the protein sense into glucose and, and handle the overload, so to speak, or the overflow. The problem is that you want to make sure you don't go too low, so you got to keep testing your blood sugars until you figure out the right equation that works for you. Now, like I said, dosing Humalog is a lot more precise and complicated than, say, a long-acting insulin, which, which there's a fudge factor there, meaning that if you take a little too much or a little too little, it's not going to really make a big difference because it doesn't hit you right away. Um, and this is how we control blood sugar. These are the, the right ways to do it, and as a bodybuilder, if you can figure out and utilize this in your protocols, Long term, when you eventually stop bodybuilding and eating, you know, eight times a day and, and you know, uh, you know, seven thousand calories a day, and you become a normal human being like I have, amazingly enough, I don't know if I'm, I'm normal, but I, I certainly eat on a more normal schedule now and a normal, more normal quantity. Um, I don't have to take insulin because my, my blood sugars are able to handle it. So that's the way insulin works. Phase one, phase two. Phase one is what fails first. We want to try to help the pancreas a little bit. We start with a longer acting insulin to take the burden off of, of the pancreas long term. If that's not good enough and we're still not controlling blood sugars, we have to go to a fast acting insulin. Now you could also use something known as Humulin R. Humulin R is not quite as fast acting. It, only, it, it kind of releases in two, two amounts. So initially, let's say you take five units or ten, 10 units of Humulin R. You'll get the first five units hitting you immediately, which would cover 50 grams of carbs, just like Humulog would. And then Two hours later, you get the rest of it being delivered. Okay, so this would cover two meals. So when I used to bodybuild back in the day, and I would uh, I didn't use a long acting insulin. We didn't really know much about that, and they really weren't very good long actings anyway. I would eat a lot of food, so I knew that I wasn't absorbing all my food, even though I never tested blood sugar. I just knew by how my body looked, and I would take Humulin R twice a day because it covered two meals. So I would get it would cover breakfast and then the meal two hours later, and then I would take it like five hours from the first injection, and I would do it, and it would cover two more meals for me during the day. And that would be my four big food meals, and then I would drink like three or four shakes in addition to that, which I really didn't feel that I needed the insulin for. And I found that that worked perfectly, and I felt good, and I grew really well in it. So you can do that if you're lazy, rather than taking a Humalog shot every meal. Humalog R seems to be a little easier, and it has to be administered a little less often. Um, probably if I was bodybuilding nowadays, I'd probably go with a long acting to take that burden off my pancreas even more because of the long acting insulins that are out there and of how good they are. Now there's actually even uh, something called a Fresen now that's out there that's a, a nasal inhaled insulin, but, and, and that really, it almost mimics the way your body naturally produces insulin. But once again, if you're not a type one diabetic and you do produce your own insulin, you're not trying to replace your insulin, you're just trying to supplement it and help the pancreas to not have to work quite as hard. All right, I hope this little talk helped you understand how insulin works in the body and how you can help your body to, for, uh, to take the burden off that pancreas and preserve your beta cell function uh, so that you don't become a, ty a, a type 1 diabetic or type, I say type 2 diabetic later in life uh, because, let's face it, you don't want to have to take, take insulin the rest of your life. But while you're bodybuilding and putting a strain on your body, this might be something that you might want to consider doing. Now, when you're dieting for a show, obviously, you probably won't need this. Um, it's usually only when you're eating massive amounts of food trying to gain weight. All right, Dave Palumbo here with another supplement and science review. If you like what you see, make sure you hit that subscribe button. We'll see you next time.